Good morning, St. Timothy. So good to see you again this week. Happy seventh Sunday of Easter and happy Memorial Day today as we remember those who died in service of our country and our freedom. We celebrate them, we give thanks to them and to their families for their lives. We thank God for them and the country thanks them for their service and for all they did for us through their work and through their death. So we remember them today in our prayers and in our songs. And let us begin our song and our service today with an opening song, How Him with Many Crowns. Good morning, and please be seated wherever you are. I remember when I was a young boy, about 10 years old, my best friend, Ernest, and I both lived in the uh, projects in New York City at Lower Manhattan called the Valadix. He lived on the third floor of the same building, and I lived on the fifth floor. And we did all kinds of things together. We played baseball, we played handball, we played stickball and kicked the can. We, read, we played Ringo Livio and all the other games that you played down in New York City. And so we were buds. And every so often he would come to my house and we would sit down, watch TV. And other times I'd go to his house and I would sit down and watch TV. Or rather we would lie down because the TV was low and so we would lie on the floor. And I remember one particular experience that I had when I was there. We were both kind of falling asleep because we were tired from playing. And Wheezy, his mother, 
That's the only name I ever knew her by, Wheezy, and her sister, which I am sorry I don't remember her name. We're both kind of talking, and I mentioned to you at one time that when they would talk every so often, you would hear a mm-hmm. And that was a subtle, wonderful way of making you feel like you were being rocked, being cradled. And you could hear these two women who have been experiencing all kinds of things because they had been many years in New York and they're black, they're a black couple. And so they would sit there and talk and every so often you hear the mm-hmm and I was just falling asleep. I couldn't help it. I felt really warm and cozy on that, on that floor. But then they were talking about Ernest and myself. And one of the things I remember is that, that Wheezy said, I hope they'll be as good friends when they grow up. And then she said, I wonder what they'll be when they grow up. And then I heard the sister say, mm-hmm. <laughs> and then so she was talking about Ernest and she said that Ernest may be a doctor. That he, she hoped that he would be a doctor. And she said, mm, he looks good. he'll be a good old doctor. Mm-hmm. And then she said, Willie, he, will he might be a, a good teacher. Maybe he'll be a teacher or maybe he'll be, uh, I don't know, some kind of lawyer or something. And mm-hmm. But I remember when I heard those words, she gave me a vision. It was because I was captured by her ability to see me in the future, which is something I had not experienced before, that I was able to create a future based on the words she gave me. She said, I see you as, as, a, as a teacher. And I said to myself, yeah, I can see myself too as a teacher. She gave me a vision. And I remember from that day that I kept that in my mind and in my heart and soul that Maybe I could be a teacher. She had given me something in the words while she was speaking with her sister without realizing that I was overhearing. Today, there is another kind of overhearing that we're doing. We have the privilege of overhearing Jesus who is praying for us. Jesus, as you know, after he says his prayer, will go over the Kidron Valley and will face his death. And if you ever want to know what a man or woman really think, listen to their prayer before they die. Listen to what it is that they say that's important in their lives and the people whom they have in their lives. And so what we have is a privileged moment to hear what's important for Jesus as he faces the most difficult time of his life. And so the first thing he does, the first five verses, Jesus is praying for himself. Jesus is asking God to Reveal him as a son of God. He's telling God, I have done the work you've given me. I have brought the people that you've given me to you. Let them see you as I see you. Let them love you as I love you. Let them know that I am truly the son of God. And then he says something really interesting. He says, and I want to return to that place where I was with you before the earth was created, before the foundation of all creation. I want to go back there to be with you. He knew that that would be his destiny, and that was the deepest part of his prayer, besides the fact that he wanted to make sure he fulfilled the Father's will by teaching his disciples and the people there about who God was. But then he does another part of the prayer, and the other part of the prayer is for his disciples and for you and me. And what he says there is profoundly important for us to listen to, the privilege to be able to hear, that Jesus says, that eternal life is to know God. And that eternal life is to know Jesus is in and with God. That that is what he prays for us to know. And that he prays for us to be one. He prays for us to be one in people and one in nation. And that we will all be one. That the world will be one. You see, I think in this particular reading, Jesus is giving us to us in a very, very small set of words, the point of his ministry, the complete gospel, if you will, about why he came and why he wanted to uh, spend his life with us so that we will become one, that we will recognize God, that we will recognize Christ as the bearer of God among us, and that we will become one. That's the gospel message. God wants us to be one, not to be the same, not to be equal, equally in the same ideas, not to be equal in the same thoughts or the same characteristics. He wants us to be one, but to be one in the multiplicity and the plurality of what that means. 
and the richness of being one and the diversity of being one. This is what Jesus is asking us to do because he's asking for the world and us to be one. And one thing that we don't see today is that oneness at all. What we see is that we're fighting against nature, we're fighting against each other, we're fighting against other nations. We're even fighting with our family members because of political reasons. We have been so divided that we don't even recognize the other as part of who we are. We see them as enemies, as foes, as competitors, as someone that need, need to be eliminated or put to be proven wrong. And that's not the point that Jesus is making. He's saying that you can be different, but you must be one. How do you hold that tension of being one while you're different? Well, that means that you see the essence from which you become. It means that you, you see the, the basic uh, uh, similarities that we all carry together. We all have eyes, we all have ears, we have hair, we have arms, we have a heart, we have dreams, we have kids, we have work. We all have these same things. And this is what makes us one, the fact that we can see each other as ourselves, not as an enemy, not as a competitor, not as someone that has such a wrong idea that we need to eliminate from our, our service. And so Jesus says, be one, which is the hardest and highest call that he can ask of us. Because that means that we have to look at the other and try to understand the other as an other being as another face of God that looks at us, as another creature of God that is present in our world with a different point of view, with a different perspective. And that means that we could learn to add that to our own and to become bigger because of it, not to be reduced, not to become adversarial, but to become larger, to become more embraceable, more inclusive in what it is that, 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 that truth and beauty can hold. Jesus says, I hope they see that you and I are one, and I wish and pray that they are one with me. Mine are yours, and yours are mine. There's no separation there. There's no division of the people there. There's no the rich first and the poor later. There's no the politics first, and then the others what our politics next. Those who live in the South or those who live in the North, those who are Black or those who are white, those who are gay or straight, he doesn't say any of that stuff. He says, they are one with us. And we have to figure out what that one means. And that means that we have to operate from that basic premise that the brother I see that doesn't look like me is like me. And I must find that common ground. I must find that common meaning that we share together as human beings. And I must honor that individual with that uh, particular point of view as I hope they honor mine. And so when you look at the face of the other, you might be, actually see the image of God. Do you remember the story? It was a wonderful story. It was called The Lion King by Disney. And Musafa was Simba's dad. He was a lion. And Musafa died. And his friend Rafiki saw Simba kind of weeping and mourning and grieving his dad, his lion dad. And so he says, you know, I'll show you your father. Come, I'll show you your father. And Simba says to him, no, don't be ridiculous. My dad is dead. He says, no, 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 come, come. So in the movie, he brings him to a lake. And he says, look at the water. And Simba looks at the water. He says, no, oh, that's ridiculous. I see myself. I can only see me. And he says, no, look again. Look again, look deeper. And as Simba was looking into the water, into his face, he began to see the contours of his father. He began to see the eyes that reflected the eyes of his father, his nose that reflected the nose of his father. He began to see his father in his image. And when he did that, he saw that his father was in him, that his father had never left him. That's what Jesus is praying for us today, that when we look at the poor person out there or the homeless individual or the unemployed person, that when we look at them, we see Jesus. We see the face and the contours of Jesus. We see the nose, the eyes, the hair, the heart, the potential of Jesus in that individual. You see, my friends, we're not brought into this world to fight each other. We're not brought into this world to beat each other down. We're not better than anybody else. We just need to recognize that we need each other in order to be able to raise this world and our life in a way that is 
Blessed, the kingdom of God is near us. But we have to embrace it around us with the people that we have and stop this war, stop this division, stop this hatred, stop this bickering. We have independence in the United States, but we also have responsibility. If you want to fight for independence, then also fight for the responsibility that comes with it. And that you then are responsible for your brother, you're responsible for the earth, you're responsible for your neighbors, you're responsible for other nations. This is not a time to run behind walls or nationalism. This is not the time to run behind ideologies. This is the time to see that the human reality that we have in front of us is the reality brought to us by God himself and his son. And that is asking us to be one. The highest call of the gospel is to be run, to hold the tension, to hold the balance, to be able to hold the differences that God has created through his generous and bountiful nature. So that when we hold it, we become more than the particular parts that we are defending and killing for. So Jesus prays for us today. He prays for you and he prays for me and he prays for all of us around here. He prays for all the people that we may not know that are sick or in some death camps or, or in some prison somewhere. He prays for all of us. And he says, I pray that they will see that you are in me and they are in me and we are one. The greatest torture we have in today's modern history is that we feel alienated from ourselves and each other. The pervasive feeling right now is one of anxiety and angst. We feel ourselves separated from all that gives life. And here, right here, we have the answer that Jesus is giving us. To see in the face of the other, the presence of the God who created all. And if you see that, then you can respond with the joy and the health and the beauty and the willingness and welcome for that individual to be part of who you are. And you know what? We will get through anything if we begin to see God in each of us. There will be no particular problems, no virus, no COVID, anything that will tear us apart or pull us apart. We need to be brought together again. We need to be one again. This is the gospel call and this is the gospel good news. May we do it. And when we do it, see the face of God in each and every one of us. And may God bless us to do so. Amen.